My name is Brad Dean. I uh, basically am a thorough scholar. I've been studying thorough now for, I guess it's been close to 30 years. I hate to confess that, but it's been about 30 years um, since I first encountered Thoreau. Basically my area of expertise with Thoreau is his manuscripts. I reconstruct his manuscripts uh, to come up with works that he never lived to publish. So that's basically who I am and what I do. What I'm working on right now is Thoreau's uh, notebooks on the Native Americans. Uh, basically in uh, about the period of time right after Thoreau left Walden, uh, 1848, he, possibly 1849, he began working on a series, on a, on a large project that involved reading everything he could find about the Native American cultures. And he had access to Harvard's incredible library, so he read practically every important uh, history or account of Native Americans, all the expeditions, all the archaeological studies that were being conducted at that time by the Smithsonian Institute, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, and and so on. He read um, a little over, he, and he kept notes, by the way, and uh, there are a little over 500 sources. He seems to have been intent on studying, like a scholar would study, uh, indigenous cultures to try to find the embodiment of the wild. His famous, uh, Thoreau has this famous, uh, from his essay, Walking, a famous quotation, in wildness is the preservation of the world. Uh, civilization entails a certain amount of self-consciousness, and I think Thoreau was trying to get a step away from that with his uh, idea of wildness. I think for Thoreau, the the uh, the red man, as he called him, was the was the wild man in the, in the best sense of the term. So he wanted to see if he could understand the way the Native Americans related to their environment before they learned how to relate to their environment from uh, from the white folks who were coming over. And it's a very interesting experiment and yielded, as I said, to these 12 notebooks. And these notebooks that I'm working on now, I'm editing as 12 manuscript notebooks, about 4,000 manuscript pages, uh, basically his reading notes um, from that project. And you can see a lot of Native American attitude in his writings. Uh, the way that they respected the land, he respected the land in the same way. Uh, and that was from a very early age. Uh, there's even a, a brief journal entry when he's younger, I think in his teens, where he's writing in fake Indian language, you know, me love him type stuff. But he's not doing that because he's being a racist. He's doing that because he really admires the Native American spirit and the Native American mind. And that was the way it was for his entire life. The evidence of Thoreau's early interest in Native Americans pretty much is that. It's a very stereotypical, romantic sort of view. It's the Hiawatha syndrome, you know, uh, me tanto, that sort of thing. It's not very sophisticated. It's what you would pretty much expect a young man in uh, earlier mid 19th century America to have kind of an unsophisticated attitude toward Native Americans, a sort of romantic attitude toward Native Americans. What you see throughout his life is a much, much more increasingly sophisticated uh, interest. His interest towards the end of his life is very, very, uh, um, even beyond scholarly. Um, he wants to know, he's adamant about getting his mind around what Native Americans are really like in Native American culture, not the way they actually were, well, in addition to the way they actually were in mid-19th century America, but also anti-Columbian, before Columbus discovered the New World. Now, if you think about it, in a sense, it's kind of impossible to do that, of course, because uh, you have to rely on uh, what, there's oral traditions, I suppose, in the Native American cultures. There's uh, archaeological digs. Uh, there are uh, the early accounts, and for Thoreau, Thoreau's purposes, the most important source were the early explorers' accounts of the discovery of the New World. He made three trips to, to the Maine woods, and on his third and final trip, he met a gentleman named Joseph Polis, who was uh, a member of the Penobscot tribe, was fairly prominent in the Penobscot. He's kind of like a leader of the Penobscot tribe. Thoreau hired him to be the guide. They went into the woods for a period of time, quite a long period of time, and Thoreau got to know him very well. So well, in fact, and so impressed was Thoreau with him that towards the end of his life, uh, it became very clear, and, and Emerson and several others had pointed out that Thoreau had three uh, again at the end of his life, that he had three heroes, you might say. One was Walt Whitman. 
One was John Brown, the famous abolitionist, uh, the Harper Ferry fame. And the other was Joe Polis, this uh, Native American guide. Thoreau, in his book, The Maine Woods, write about, writes about his relationship with Joe Polis, and it's a fascinating relationship. You know, what was it about Joe Polis that Thoreau found so fascinating, so intriguing, that put him in his, not even pantheon, it's just the top three people in his life, these are the big heroes. What was it that caused Thoreau to like Joe Polis so much? I think it was that Joe Polis embodied a kind of a synthesis of Native American cultures and white culture. That Joe Polis was able to succeed and flourish in, white, in the white community. He was able to be a leader not only in the Native American community, but also in its interactions between the Native Americans and the white community. Uh, but also was able to go out into the woods and uh, behave, you might say, as a Native American very successfully could keep himself alive in the woods and even comfortable in the woods. And Thoreau was very impressed by that. I say, Quay. Quay is hello. Quay. My name is Arnie Neptune. I'm, uh, I'm a member of the Penobscot tribe of Indians uh, who has been in uh, the state of Maine for about 12,000 years. What could have driven Henry David Thoreau to spend much of his life seeking the true nature of the Native American Indian. What we're going to do tonight is ponder the mystical nature of a mountain and the mystical nature of Henry Thoreau and the mystical nature of the Native American Indian. Mystical, of or stemming from direct communion with ultimate reality or God. Of or having a spiritual reality or import not apparent to the intelligence or senses. The future is the key and I have a sense of the incredible potential of the love in the human heart and the love in all of creation. I will ask you to ponder the pieces of the puzzle we're going to offer you here tonight and see if, if there might be a perspective from which we can open our hearts and minds and become peace and justice and freedom. All those things that we're carrying in this flag that we're waving these days. and. Uh, Gandhi said, we must become the change we wish to see in the world. Albert Einstein saw the world as a puzzle meant for deciphering. And Ro Roger Rosenblatt in his 1999 Time Magazine article, The Age of Einstein, stated, Einstein understood that the world was a puzzle created for deciphering, and more, that a person's place in the order of things was to solve as much of that puzzle as possible. That is what makes us human this and the governing elements of morals and humor. Well, Thoreau, in, in, when he wandered around Concord, and he found arrowheads all over Concord, he picked those arrowheads up and he said, here is a character that has yet to be deciphered. There is a great love that exists from the Creator, who created the Father and the Son, Father, Son, the Mother Earth, and that is generated and shown to us. This is the love that the Creator has for all people and all things and all life in the universe. I think that the main thing that attracts me to, to Henry Thoreau is uh, his rebelliousness, his, his ideas that he, he wants to question all authority. Uh, throughout his life he was always questioning the church, the government, uh, the press, and he was really trying to to make people accountable for the way that they act in real life. Um, he hated hypocrisy, he hated stupidity, um, and he really wanted to try to question everything that he could and make people be aware that there's more to the world than just what we see. Um, he was an incredibly spiritual person. Everything that he wrote uh, came from a spiritual base. So he was trying to get people to wake up to wake up to the fact that we are part of the world, that we are part of nature, that God created that tree and he created us and, and that we all have to live in harmony together. Um, nature was something that, that you needed to respect. Um, nature wasn't just for us to use, just to cut down trees for firewood. Uh, but nature is something that we have to learn to get along with because it's part of us. And if we lose a tree or if we lose a species of animal or what have you, that takes a little bit away from us as well.
Um, and, and so as a spiritual person, he really wanted people to wake up to that fact that we are all part of, of the universe, that we are all part of God's world, and, and that we need to act accordingly uh, so that we're more aware of our place in the world as spiritual human beings. Thoreau's attitude about science, what we now call science, and in fact Thoreau himself called science, and Thoreau had a different attitude about something he called natural history, or on occasion he called it natural philosophy. And Thoreau's attitude about science, well, he generally was antithetical to science, generally. Um, and let me exp I think this example will give you uh, some idea of what I'm talking about. In 1853, March of 1853, he received a letter from Spencer Baird. Spencer or Spencerton? Spencer, right? Spencer Baird. Yeah. Oh, here it is. Spencer Fullerton Baird. That's why I keep getting messed up. Um, in uh, March of 1853, and and that uh, early in March of 53, and Thoreau wrote in his journal that evening when he he had been obviously been thinking about this, getting this letter, and here's what he writes in his journal. Baird was the secretary of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The secretary of the Association for the Advancement of Science requested me uh, by a printed circular letter from Washington the other day to fill the blanks against certain questions among which the most important one was what branch of science I was specially interested in using the term science in the most comprehensive sense possible. Now, though I could state to a select few that Department of Human Inquiry which engages me, which uh, yeah, which engages me and should be rejoice and should be and I think it should be should rejoice at the at an opportunity so to do. I felt that it would be to make myself the laughing stock of the scientific community to describe or attempt to describe to them that branch of science which specifically interests me, inasmuch as they do not believe in a science which deals with the higher law. Higher law would have a particular historic context in this sense. It was often used in the in the slavery debate, for instance, with Seward talking about the higher law the laws of conscience as opposed to the constitutional law. So um, that's, in a sense, that's the kind of a context for what Thoreau means about a higher law. So I was obliged to speak to their condition and describe to them that poor part of me which alone they can understand. The fact is I am a mystic, a transcendentalist, and a natural philosopher to boot. Now I think of it, I should have told them at once that I was a transcendentalist. That would have been the shortest way of telling them that they would not understand my explanation. <laughs> um, but in the, I remember he says here that um, he was obliged to speak to their condition and describe to them that poor part of me which alone they can understand. Here's what he wrote in Branches of Science in, in which a special interest is felt. Thoreau wrote, the manners and customs of the Indians of the Algonquin group previous to contact with the civilized man. That's, I read this to uh, Ed Wilson one time, and he couldn't believe it. He said, what do you mean? Thoreau didn't, you know, he wasn't an ethnologist at all. Well, in fact, he was. Nobody knows about it yet. Way in the past, when, uh, when, when there was magic, when the people could do magic, they could transform themselves into different uh, creatures. They called shapeshifters. They could, uh, they could make things happen. They could, uh, they could make, uh, make things out of nothing. They could uh, change themselves, they could make themselves disappear, they could create things as the Creator does. And uh, they could speak to the animals, and speak to the trees, and speak to the plants, and um, actually ask plants, what, is, what, what medicine would they be good for? What could they heal the human race? I know my uh, legend has it that uh, my grandfather was able to transform himself, uh, himself into a uh, uh, a, a giant eel, and uh, you know, he was able to go with the eels. They would go with them to, to uh, turn himself into an eel and go with them for, for teachings, learning, and so forth. And we thank the Mother Earth for what we get, like all, this, all these things here, which are, to a lot of people are things or plants, but there's medicines in almost everything you see around here. And, and this is how the Creator took care of us and took care of our people and showed us how to live. And, and not to have to be in want of anything. And, and we didn't. We were, we were never in want of anything because the, the medicines were there to heal us, the, the animals were there to feed us and clothe us, the trees there were there to shelter us. And that's how our people lived for thousands of years. Thoreau famously stayed at Walden Pond for two years, two months, and two days between 1845 and 1847. About halfway during uh, Thoreau's stay at the pond, 
He went to the Maine woods, his first trip to the Maine woods, and climbed uh, Mount Katahdin, the highest uh, peak in the state of Maine. And it's interesting to see what he has to say. There's, he, has, he actually has quite a, ver a long uh, passage about it. But what I'd like to do is just read what I regard as the most critical component of this long passage. It's among thorough scholars, it's, it's fa fairly well known as the contact passage, and you'll see why in a moment. I stand in awe of my body, he writes. This matter to which I am bound has become so strange to me. I fear not spirits, ghosts of which I am one, that my body might, but I fear bodies, I tremble to meet them. What is this titan that has possession of me? Talk of mysteries, think of our life and nature, daily to be shown matter, to come in contact with it. Rock, trees, wind on our cheeks, the solid earth, the actual world, the common sense. Contact, contact, who are we? Where are we? This is kind of, I think, for Thoreau, this is kind of a seminal experience, this, an experience that you have out in the world that gets you down to some of the most foundational, fundamental questions, questions that even involve who you are, questions of identity, uh, epistemology, I mean, again, some of the most philosophically basic questions. The spirit of the mountain is always there, and it draws people there. It draws people that comes there who are non-Indians, and they don't know the reason why they are drawn there, but they are drawn there because of the spirit, the spirit of the mountain. In Thoreau's studies, there, this is a very controversial passage. It's been written about by many different scholars. Um, the cons not the consensus, the, well, I guess it is a consensus. Most of the scholars who read this assert that Thoreau here is traumatized by what he sees on top of the mountain. I happen to think they're, they're dead wrong myself. Um, I think, and I'll, maybe I'll read myself here because I think instead of trying to get it off the top of my head, uh, I'll, I'll just tell you what I think. The crafted prose of the contact passage reflects not emotional turmoil, but the finer frenzy of thorough the transcendentalist prophet straining the capabilities of language to describe the, what Emerson called the original relation to the universe he, Thoros, experienced atop the mountain. This important passage is Thoreau's attempt to articulate the ineffable, for Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, like Moses on Mount Sinai, had beheld God, or spirit, and nature, or matter, face to face. Um, so you can see I have a somewhat unconventional or uh, different interpretation of the, of the uh, con contact passage. You have Thoreau on Mount Katahdin, you have Moses on Mount Sinai. There's a correspondence between the two, and Thoreau is attempting to leverage that correspondence to basically make his own essay a scripture. As a human being, as a person on this earth, I have a certain uh, ingrained divinity, a certain truth that is inside each and every living creature. Uh, you can call it truth, you can call it conscience, you can call it intuition, you may call it what you will, but that is that divine spark inside all of us. And we all know basic truths. We all know truth, we all know beauty, we all know love. Even if we were deaf, dumb, and blind, we would know what those things are. The, the Creator has put this spirit in all of us. It seems to be more, it seems to be more pronounced and prevalent in the Indian ways but everybody has it, no matter what color, shape, form you may be, you have that, and that's this, how this body holds it. One of the more important things I think that Thoreau has to offer us nowadays is this insight into the miraculousness of this reality that we can, from one perspective, it's just commonplace, but from another perspective, it's, it's not commonplace at all. It's... Uh, what Carlos Castaneda called a separate reality, uh, a reality that is imbued with everything that uh, all of the human traditions have called sacred, uh, as opposed to the more mundane, not necessarily profane, but mundane uh, reality, the one, that, you know, the workaday world, uh, the world of getting and spending.
Uh, he was looking to Native American cultures and other cultures around the world, but particularly seemed to be interested in Native American cultures, to leverage the strengths and the insights of those cultures to improve upon this experimental new American culture that had emerged in the new world. Uh, he wanted, as he said, to keep the new world new. And to do that, he drew, he wasn't being necessarily revolutionary, although I think it's fundamentally revolutionary, but he was drawing on existing or pre-existing cultures and insights, the Judeo-Christian cultures and insights, the Native American cultures and insights, taking those and bringing them together in a dynamic mix that worked for him and that he appears to have thought would work for the rest of the country. A lot of people misinterpret, uh, not a lot, but a few people, miss, in my opinion, misinterpret what Thoreau's about by calling him an anarchist. Uh, many anarchists say that Thoreau is, uh, you know, Thoreau is sympathetic to our point of view, that he wants no government, when in fact, right at the very beginning of civil disobedience, he says, I do not ask at once for no government, I want at once a better government. Um, so it's not that he's an anarchist, uh, quite clearly. An anarchist uh, is not, I don't think anarchists can claim Thoreau. What Thoreau is basically suggesting, and I think Thoreau's real view toward government is, he says that government is best which governs least and followed out, that government is best which governs not at all. And then and he, he puts a period at the end of that sentence, but really to understand what he's talking about, what you need to do, in a sense, is, if you don't mind me putting a parenthesis to Henry David Thoreau, what you need to do is say, you know, that government is best which governs not at all, in parentheses, because in such a government, all the citizens govern themselves. That's key. What Thoreau wants is self-governors. Everyone is their own king and governor and Congress and Senate, and you do not need laws to oppress you because you have a law inwardly that manifests itself in your conduct outwardly. So that's what Thoreau's idea of government is not anarchism. It is basically at the most individual level self-government. The heart of Walden, the really important part, comes later with the exploration of the inward mourning, to use, you know, the inward journey, the inward voyage. It's all inward. It's all spiritual. It's all at that level of the higher law that really is important for Thoreau. When you talk about law as opposed to conscience, what you are really talking about is, is higher laws. It's an ethical awakening. He's not talking about a, a physical awakening and getting up in the morning and raising your head out of the bed. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the effort, as he puts it, to throw off sleep, moral lethargy, the effort to become truly alive. To be awake is to be alive. I have never yet met a man who is quite awake. We must learn to reawaken and keep ourselves awake, not by mechanical aids, but by an infinite expectation of the dawn. In a little book called Mystics as a Force for Change, an India Indian named Ghost states, Mysticism proposes a revolution from above and by consciousness. To say technology is the grammar of the future is dangerous nonsense. Technique and transcendence must learn to work together. That would be the beginning of the total man and totality thinking. And the individuals who will most help humanity in the hour of crisis are those who recognize a willed change from within as a step to a total change in our relationship with reality, the harmony of the whole. He further states, the issue is plain. What is the true nature of things and how do we embody it in our social living? Well, Albert Einstein stated, that no problem was ever solved in the same consciousness in which it was created. We have built a house of cards on a false foundation of false assumptions that our logical minds have, given the information we have, responded logically and have gotten us to where we are right now. That once we have and come to grasp the correct, accurate information about the nature of the universe, that our logical minds will take us to peace on earth, will have us bringing heaven on earth. So we saunter toward the Holy Land, till one day the sun shall shine more brightly than ever he has done, 
shall perchance shine into our minds and hearts and light up our whole lives with a great awakening light as warm and serene and golden as on the bankside in autumn. Conclusion of Walking, Henry David Thoreau.